Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Velikovsky Channel, where we examine the history and the mysteries of the ancient world from the perspective of the ideas of Emmanuel Velikovsky. Now, without question, one of the most intriguing and enduring mysteries of ancient times centered around the question of Atlantis, the legendary island said by Plato to have been the home of a great civilization a civilization located by him in the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere to the west of the Straits of Gibraltar in southern Spain. Now, it would be impossible as well as pointless to examine the countless theories and hypotheses concerning Atlantis, which have been published over the past 2,000 years. Many of these are so outlandish that it would be a waste of time to mention, far less examine them. Atlantis, for example, has variously been placed in the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, Antarctica, and even more recently on Mars. Now, Velikovsky also mentioned Atlantis, but what he said about it, in contrast to the speculations of so many others, is well worth considering. Velikovsky's fundamental premise, of course, was that great cataclysms of nature had struck the Earth within the span of recorded history and that these events were characterized by massive disruption of the Earth's tectonic plates. Such events, he said, caused land and sea in many parts of the world to change places. In some areas, land masses sank into the ocean. In others, new land appeared. In several parts of the world, mountain ranges rose thousands of feet overnight. So for Velikovsky, the story of Atlantis was, uh, was just one piece of a greater jigsaw he was assembling or attempting to assemble and his project to reveal the true history of our planet. In line with Plato's testimony, Velikovsky looked to the Atlantic Ocean in his search for clues. There, about 800 miles off the coast of Portugal, we find the Azores Archipelago, a group of small islands long associated with Atlantis. Indeed, the Azores are still popularly termed Los Vestigios de Atlantida, I think is how it's pronounced, the vestiges of Atlantis among the Portuguese. Plato, whose description of Atlantis was ultimately derived from Egypt, claimed in his Timaeus that Atlantis was a volcanic island with a multitude of hot springs and with dimensions roughly corresponding to an island the size of Iceland or maybe a little bit bigger. This landmass, he claimed, was located opposite or in front of the Pillars of Hercules, i.e. the Straits of Gibraltar. As a group of volcanic islands with numerous hot springs lying directly west of the Straits of Gibraltar, the Azores have therefore naturally, over the centuries, attracted the attention of Atlantologists. Now, if the interested reader looks up the Azores in popular mainstream publications, he or she will be informed that the Azores are part of the volcanic mid-Atlantic ridge and that they have been rising out of the ocean, not sinking, for many thousands of years. Upward pressure of the Earth's tectonic plates on the mid-Atlantic ridge, it is claimed, has only in the comparatively recent past produced the tiny islands of the Azores. Before that, he or she will be informed there was nothing there but ocean. But before going a step further, I have to state here and now that this is an utter and apparently deliberate fabrication. For the fact is, as demonstrated by numerous oceanographic studies over the past 75 years, the Azores sit on top of a piece of continental land comprised of granite and sedimentary rock which formed a substantial island, somewhat bigger than Iceland, in the comparatively recent past. This part of continental material is now known as the Azores microplate, and its existence is now part of accepted knowledge among geologists and oceanographers. It's now been accepted among many scientists that this sunken mini-continent or island only disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene, the age of the mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers, or even more recently, in what is known as the Holocene. An oceanographic expedition in the 1940s, headed by Professor Morris Ewing of Columbia University, was perplexed to find a host of, quote, new scientific puzzles around the Azores 
and the nearby Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Among these were sunken beaches, as well as evidence of, quote, massive volcanic activity in the area in the geologically recent past. Most spectacularly, perhaps, Professor Ewing found near the Azores an uncharted submarine mountain, 8,000 feet high, with, quote, many layers of volcanic ash, and further on a great chasm dropping down 1,809 fathoms, that is 10,854 feet, quote, as if a volcano had caved in there at some time in the past, unquote. As well as sunken shorelines and continental material, Ewing's expedition also discovered large amounts of coral deep under the ocean. Now, coral only thrives in shallow waters, and this was more proof of a great sinking of the land in that area. The Professor Ewing's expedition was only one of a series from many countries which around the same time reported anomalous and frankly astonishing discoveries in the Azores region. So, for example, in 1944, Swedish scientist Hans Peterson wrote, quote, The topmost of the two volcanic strata is found above the topmost glacial stratum, which indicates that this volcanic catastrophe or catastrophes occurred in post-glacial times, unquote. He goes on to spell out the implication. Quote, it can therefore not be entirely ruled out that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, as well as the nearby Azores, where the sample originated, was above sea level up to about 10,000 years ago and did not subside to its present depth until later. Unquote. In short, the continental land under the Azores was above sea level into the Holocene, the most recent geological epoch, the epoch contemporary with the Neolithic and Bronze Ages of humanity. This was a sensational claim to make and more or less constituted an official scientific seal of approval on the whole Atlantis story. Further confirmation was soon to arrive. In 1957, Dr. Rene Malaise of the Ricks Museum in Stockholm announced that a colleague, a colleague sorry, Dr. W. R. Colby, had found definitive proof of the geologically recent subsidence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Dr. Colby had been commissioned to investigate freshwater diatoms. Now, diatoms are tiny algae. They can either be freshwater or saltwater. But they found freshwater uh, diatoms uh, in deep sea cores obtained during a 1944 Swedish expedition. Although the expedition studied many parts of the globe, only those cores taken from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge near the Azores yielded the following. Multitudinous shells of freshwater diatoms and fossilized remains of terrestrial plants all dating from the Pleistocene and the Holocene epochs. And bear in mind that uh, fossilization does not take millions of years. It can take thousands or even just hundreds of years, depending on the conditions. So compelling was this evidence that by 1975, the British journal The New Scientist could produce a headline with this title, quote, Concrete Evidence of Atlantis? Question. Commenting upon another recent oceanographic expedition, the magazine noted that, quote, although they make no such fanciful claim from the results as to have discovered the mythical mid-Atlantic landmass, an international group of oceanographers has now convincingly confirmed that a sunken block of continent lies in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, unquote. Now, in spite of such sensational revelations, the academic establishment, ever fearful of rocking the boat, quickly closed ranks, explaining away or simply ignoring the uncomfortable evidence. And so, although it is now admitted that a chunk of continent lies underneath the Azores, it is claimed, in spite of the aforementioned evidence, that this island mini-continent sank into the ocean millions of years ago and long before the appearance of human beings on the world stage. Such has been the official position in Western Europe and North America over the past half century. 
However, a large group of scientists in the East, particularly in Russia and Scandinavia, have begged to differ. In 1963, for example, Russian chemist Nikolai Zirov collated all the evidence in a publication aimed at putting the Atlantis debate on a scientific footing. He quoted literally scores of geologists, oceanographers, paleontologists and biologists, many of them from the Soviet Union, who were of the opinion that the island under the Azores and parts of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge stood above sea level as recently as the end of the Ice Age and even later. Thus, for example, V. E. Hein said, quote, The rugged topography of the slopes of the submarine mountain ranges was evidently formed under sub-aerial, that means above sea level, conditions by river erosion. This is indicated by the finding of fresh water fauna on the slopes of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, unquote. In the end, Zirov and many of the Russian and Scandinavian scientists came to the conclusion that the Atlantic island centered around the Azores sank into the ocean in several stages, each stage being cataclysmic. The first of these occurred at the end of the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age as it's sometimes called, and the last occurred during the first phase of the Early Bronze Age. At this point, the last segment of the Atlantic landmass sank into the ocean, leaving nothing but the mountain peaks of the Azores as testimony to its existence. Now, archaeological evidence from the Middle East and Europe indicates a worldwide catastrophic event sometime near the end of the Early Bronze Age. An event which shattered all the ancient settlements of Mesopotamia, Anatolia, Greece, Syria, Palestine, Egypt and Europe. The same event transformed the Sahara from a well-watered uh, grassland into a parched desert. Everywhere archaeologists looked, they found evidence of massive volcanic activity and devastating changes in the climate. Now, we've got to ask ourselves then, were these events contemporary with the final sinking of the Atlantic island? Leaving aside the wild speculations of so many independent writers and mystics who insist that Atlantis was a high civilization with advanced technologies, Plato clearly describes the Atlanteans as a Bronze Age people. They worship Poseidon, the god of the sea, and of earthquakes, and they have a bull cult. Bull cults were, of course, found throughout the ancient Mediterranean from Spain to the coast of Syria, and they were particularly important during the Neolithic and Early Bronze Ages, as, for example, at Çatalhöyük in modern Turkey and various other sites. Plato describes the Atlanteans as a seafaring people whose island home was roughly triangular in shape. The shorelines of the island were mountainous, but in the middle of their stretch a great plain. Here stood the capital, surrounded by a succession of concentric circular moats, each of them accessible to ships, with the shrine of Poseidon located at the centre. A canal or channel connected the capital city with the ocean. Now, it has often been remarked that the overall plan of, Atlant of Plato's Atlantis uh, bears a striking resemblance to ancient Carthage as well as to the other ancient settlements in the Mediterranean. This, of course, is correct, but it does not mean, as some have tried to argue, that Atlantis was simply an invention of Plato's and that he modelled his lost civilization on Carthage or some other Mediterranean city or culture. The fact is, settlements with concentric circular fortifications or features were commonplace through, through the western seaboard of Europe and North Africa during the Neolithic and early Bronze Ages. A similar feature occurs, for example, at the Neolithic settlement of Los Milares in Spain. And at this stage we should point out that the story of a lost island or homeland in the Atlantic Ocean is found among virtually all of the peoples of Western Europe and North Africa. The tradition is still very much alive among the Berber-speaking peoples of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. One of the most fascinating details of Plato's account is the assertion that to the west of Atlantis there stretched a great continent, which the Atlanteans were able to reach via a series of small islands which acted as stepping stones. It would appear that here we are presented with the first mention of America in European literature. 
Christopher Columbus was certainly aware of this statement of Plato's and it undoubtedly influenced his decision to sail across the Atlantic. We should note here too that in his Critias, the other dialogue along with the Timaeus in which Plato speaks of Atlantis, he describes the latter as, quote, bigger than Libya and Asia put together, unquote. He also speaks of elephants in Atlantis. So it would appear that in the Critias, Plato has America confused with Atlantis, which in the Timaeus he clearly describes as a smallish island, as I said, roughly the size of Iceland. We should note, too, that during the Pleistocene, there were indeed many elephants of many species in North and South America. So ever since the late 19th century, when Ignatius Donnelly published his bestseller, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, Researchers have been struck by the obvious parallels between the early civilizations of the old world and the new, of which mummification and pyramid building are the most obvious examples. Mainstream academia has, of course, dismissed the parallels as significant or as being evidence of ancient transatlantic contact. It is stated, for example, that the Egyptians had long ceased to build pyramids before the peoples of Peru and Mexico had raised the first of theirs. And so we're told that the Egyptians ended pyramid building around 2000 BC, whereas the Mexicans didn't build the first of theirs until around 1000 BC. How then, it is said, could they be connected? It's clear from this that the whole question of chronology is crucial to understanding the ancient past. And this was a point stressed repeatedly by Velikovsky. The chronology of ancient civilizations, he said, is wrong. And this error has distorted our view of the ancient civilizations. In line with Velikovsky's proposal, and influenced also, I might say, by the work of Professor Gunnar Heinsen, I have argued in my book, The Genesis of Israel and Egypt, that the civilizations of the old world and the new rose simultaneously, and that they were all directly influenced by the great natural cataclysms occurring at the time. Blood sacrifice, circumcision, and pyramid building appeared simultaneously on both sides of the Atlantic. And these were the result, partly, of a common reaction to events of nature, but also, to some degree, to ancient transoceanic contact. If you like that video, please uh, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.